Good evening, everyone who's um, entering the webinar. We're just going to give it another couple minutes so everyone can um, can get in who is going to be joining us for the beginning of this webinar. So just another couple minutes and then and then we'll start. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start now, and I'm sure some people will continue to uh, trickle in slowly but surely. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, very good to see many of you all here who uh, joined us last week for last week's session. My name is Stephen Payne. I'm the director of the Bronx County Historical Society, and thank you, all of you, uh, for joining us again um, for the second lecture in a series. This is the annual spring lecture series in Bronx history. Um, really, this is the, the inaugural year, and we're very happy to have all of you with us tonight. Um, and hopefully this lecture series, the plan is for it to continue on um, in the following years. So uh, not sure what next year's lecture topic will be, um, but if there are uh, any historians or um, really anyone else uh, in the audience who thinks they might have uh, an interesting lecture to propose, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, and really the, the goal is to have probably two to three sessions. Um, so if you have uh, enough uh, information to deliver across um, two to three sessions, then uh, then would definitely love to hear from you all. And this year's topic to remind those of you who were with us last week and to uh, uh, to let those of you know who are joining us for the first time tonight, this year's topic is Bronx Fires. And as I already mentioned, it's a two-part series. Um, the first lecture last week was entitled Public Policy is Hate Crime, the 1970s Fire Epidemic. Um, and Tonight's lecture is entitled Consequences of the 1970s Fire Epidemic and the Bronx's Future. So whereas last week's lecture was looking back at the past, primarily, not exclusively, um, and analyzing what exactly happened in the Bronx during the 1970s, uh, tonight's lecture will be focused uh, more on present day and the situation that faces the Bronx right now um, as probably many, if not all of you are, are aware, um, we can continue to suffer some devastating and, and really needless fires here in the Bronx. And um, uh, Drs. Wallace will shed some uh, much needed light on what's going on with all of that tonight. Um, and as was the case last week, uh, this week's session will include around 45 minutes of lecture from the Wallaces. And we'll also have around the same amount of time for Q&A and discussion. Um, so without further ado, allow me to introduce again our two lecturers. Those of you who were with us last week, um, this information will be familiar to. Um, but those of you who are joining us anew, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce um, both of the Drs. Wallace um, so everyone knows who it is that's speaking. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Deborah Wallace. Um, Dr. Wallace received a PhD in ecology from Columbia University in 1971 and a mini residency certificate in epidemiology from Mount Sinai Department of Occupational and Environmental Medicine 
1980. She was part of the pioneers of environmental impact assessment in the 1970s in her position as manager of biological studies, first for Con Edison and then for the New York State Power Authority. She transferred environmental and ecological and analytical approaches to urban and public health studies in the 1970s. She's held positions at the Center for the Biology of Natural Systems at Queens College and for nearly 20 years at Consumers Union. Although now formally retired, she continues to acquire and analyze patterns of urban processes and their public health consequences. With her husband and co-worker, she has studied the 1970s fire epidemic, its causes and consequences for almost 50 years. Among various publications on this topic and related matters, Drs. Wallace co-authored A Plague on Your Houses, How New York City Was Burned Down and National Public Health Crumbled. And that was published in 1998 by Verso Books. Um, but there's um, definitely more recent, many more recent uh, publications as well um, that Drs. Wallace have, uh, have authored on this topic. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Roderick Wallace. Uh, Dr. Wallace is a research scientist in the Division of Epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, affiliated with the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. He has an undergraduate degree in mathematics and a PhD in physics from Columbia, and completed postdoctoral training in epidemiology at Rutgers. He has worked as a public interest lobbyist, conducting 20 years of empirical studies of fire service deployment in New York City, and received an investigator award in health policy research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In addition to material on public health and public policy, he has authored peer-reviewed studies modeling evolutionary process and heterodox economics, as well as quantitative analyses of institutional and machine cognition. He also publishes and has received awards in the military science field. So without further ado, um, I will go ahead and uh, turn things over to Drs. Wallace. And they have, uh, again, some, um, some slides that will guide their lecture. So go ahead, Drs. Wallace. Thank you again for um, this very stimulating lecture series, and we're very happy to be here and learn. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen now. There we go. Uh, just to remind you what we went over last week, um, fire units were cut in the 1970s, primarily in the same area that suffered from redlining and urban renewal, the South and Central Bronx. This triggered the fire epidemic, which caused a loss <clears throat> of tremendous percent of the housing units in that same area. Uh, some parts of this area lost as much as 80% of their housing. Massive migrations occurred to the west and the northwest, and a little bit to the southeast also. So keep these maps in mind where we go through this. Um, such a massive loss in housing cannot uh, fail to have an impact on public health. And uh, one of the things that occurred all over New York City was the tuberculosis epidemic. This is the geography of the progress of that epidemic. Uh, in 1978, that was the year of lowest incidence of TB in the city. And it was highly contained in Manhattan. Uh, the Central Bronx was the highest ranked health district for TB. The, um, <clears throat> the, the dashed lines here, the slanted lines are the other members of the top quintile of the 30 health districts. At that time, the Bronx had only two health districts of elevated incidence. By 1982, though, the Bronx had joined the top quintile and had three districts of well elevated uh, incidence of new cases. And by 1990, this epidemic was allowed to go on and on and on. By 1990, the entire Bronx had been drawn into the epidemic. Uh, it was the only borough that did not have a single health district that wasn't in epidemic. Even Manhattan had at least the wealthy east side that wasn't in epidemic. Now, <clears throat> 
TB cases are closely tied to housing overcrowding. And in the city, over the whole city, this is how extreme housing overcrowding was related to the TB cases. The numbers in the boxes are the years, 1970, 1975, 1978. Conditions were so bad in the city that <clears throat> the middle class left in large numbers. 1.3 million white people left the city between 1970 and 1980. And so the, those apartments were em emptied out and were refilled by people uh, who had been doubled and tripled up. And housing overcrowding plummeted, so did TB cases. But when mortgage rates increased to beyond the grasp of the middle class, the spigot turned off. People stopped moving out, but people continued to move into the city. Um, and so housing overcrowding increased, so did TB cases along with it. By 1990, the housing overcrowding was much, much beyond what it was in 1970, and so were the TB cases. Specifically in the Bronx, a team at Montefiore headed by Ernie Drucker looked at cases of TB in children under five. These are the preschool children and found they were occurring in families almost exclusively with extreme housing overcrowding. So the Bronx was heavily affected. Now, the epidemic began to ebb in 1993 at the same time as the ebbing of many other markers of urban disturbance, uh, HIV infections, low weight birth rates, rates of violent crime. So it took 15 years between the end of the fire epidemic in the 77, 78 period until 1993, when the communities began to show some functionality um, in uh, damping down risk behaviors. Now, there were other public health disturbances. One of them was low weight births. Uh, low weight births are strongly associated with maternal stress and have been linked with structural racism. Housing is an important influence. In 1990, Rod co-authored with his boss, uh, Elmer Struning, a paper that was published in 1990 in the uh, Bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine. And their conclusion was thus, they were comparing 1970 and 1980 rates of low weight births over the neighborhoods. Comparison of the 1970 and 1980 distributions indicates a decrease in low weight birth rates, but an increase in both tails of the 1980 distribution. This polarization reveals that some areas of New York City had achieved very low rates, while other areas had increased to exceptionally high rates. Areas in the high rate tail experienced the greatest amount of housing destruction and community devastation between 1970 and 1980. Now, this shows the rates of low weight births per 10,000 births, 10,000 live births. In 1960, the most intense rates were in the area that had also been subject to redlining and urban renewal. In 1970, the effect of urban renewal uh, is also shown, but people had been evicted and so they moved out. And so the area of low weight births, uh, high rates of low weight births spread. 1980, the most intense area of low weight births got larger. And this is the same area that was impacted by the burnout. 1990, the whole situation got completely out of hand. Um, as the whole cascade of consequences put pressure on the women living 
in the area of the burnout. Now, the top quintile of low weight births, we're, we're using the quintiles of 1960 for all of these maps. It was 14 to 18 percent of the babies born in these black zones were under 2,500 grams. That's five and a half pounds. These children were fated for a lifetime of health problems. We're also maybe seeing an intergenerational effect because the people who were children in the 1970s started giving birth in 1990. Now, we found actual evidence of intergenerational effects of the burnout. Uh, Rod and I were part of the Children's Environmental Health Center at Columbia University. And the center recruited mothers in the South Bronx and Northern Manhattan who did not smoke, did not drink, and did not do drugs. So this is the cream of the crop. Uh, the recruiting took place around uh, 1998 through 2002. And uh, we are looking at mothers who were born before 1965. The mean weight of their babies was 3,375 grams, and 6.7% of them were of low birth weight. Uh, I'm going to introduce you now to the concept of weathering. People of color are discriminated against day after day after day. This accelerates the aging process. And this is reflected in the fact that the younger the women are who give birth, the bigger their babies are. They haven't been weathered as badly as the older women. So we're seeing the effect where these younger women who were born 65 through 69 and 70 through 74, they're having on average larger babies and the percent of the low weight babies went down. But we get a reversal in 70, the women born in 75, 79 and in 80 and later where they, the birth weights of the women born right during the peak of the burnout and immediately after, those birth weights on average were even lower than the oldest mothers, uh, the births to oldest mothers. And the percent of low weight births is similar. So we are seeing an intergenerational uh, effect. The cascading continued, the cascading of the effects of the burnout continued into the 1980s. And we're still seeing average lower birth weights than in these women who were born about 10 to 15 years later than the youngest women. So we have definite proof of an intergenerational effect of the burnout. All right, well, what's the situation now with respect to low weight births? We have data from 2019, which is the latest data that the health department published. We compare the community districts of the Bronx with those of Manhattan. The great, great majority, eight out of the 12 community districts in the Bronx had over 10% of the babies born as old, has low weight births. This is a huge percent. None of the community districts in Manhattan had such a large percent of low weight births, although Central Harlem had 9.9%. So the Bronx was very hard hit and the effect is continuing. Now I'm gonna show one more uh, problem in the Bronx, namely, this is a map of the quintiles of intentional deaths. And most of these were murders and not suicides. The top maps are the rates per unit population. 
and the bottom map are the number per square mile. So this is the picture in 1970 where the same area that was hit by redlining and urban renewal has the highest number of intentional deaths per unit population. It got completely out of hand, like the lower low weight bursts, completely out of hand in 1990. This is the cascading effect, things like the crack wars, um, where the burned out area and the area to which the migrants fled are showing these very high rates. Um, the density per square mile is showing a similar thing. Uh, in 1990, it's even clearer that the area receiving the, the refugees also suffered. Now, for the unit, the deaths per unit population, there were correlations, associations. Poverty rate was a very strong association. Extreme housing overcrowding and the absolute population change from 1970. Those are the three factors that explain the, the patterns of intentional deaths in 1990. Now I'm going to turn this over to Rod, who's going to do a little more along these lines. Let's see this one. Right. Yes. These are maps of the annual number of drug-related deaths, the quintiles. The top is 1970 to 1973. The bottom is 1978 to 1982. In the words of a, a public employee in the uh, Bronx Borough President's office, at uh, the time, quote, plan shrinkage shotgun aids over the Bronx. And the principal mechanism was by the dispersal of intravenous drug use. Again, 1970 to 73, concentrated in the red lined the traditional red line zone. By 1978-82, depopulation and spread of intravenous drug use. What you also dispersed at that time were the long established social networks of drug dealing, the drug gangs. The dispersal of the networks of the drug gangs meant that those who left the central area had to compete with those who were in the receiving area. As in Northern Mexico, what one saw under such circumstances was an increase in mortal violence. If you look at the overall city numbers, this of course wasn't going on just in the Bronx, it was going on Harlem, Bushwick, Brownsville, East New York, parts of uh, South Jamaica, Queens, and so on. Massive population dispersal, massive shift of intravenous drug use, one of the principal vectors for the spread of AIDS, massive spread of conflict in the sales of drugs. Murders went from about 500 a year to 2,000 a year for 20 years. That's about 30,000 premature mortalities due to the crack wars. If you think for every person killed, you'll have an increase in weathering 
you could expect another 30,000 premature mortalities in a 20 or 30 period, year period. On top of that, you had the spread of infectious and chronic disease. What we suspect is that the over a 30 year period after the implementation of the, uh, the ethnic cleansing of uh, line shrinkage, there were a minimum of 100,000 premature mortalities. In Tulsa, there were 300 to 400. AIDS cases. Uh, AIDS deaths in the Bronx through 1988 in the top map. Again, depopulation in the red line zone, spread of population, the mixing of intravenous drug use, social networks, and their expansion. The rate of AIDS per unit population, this is the number of AIDS deaths the lower map is the rate per uh, unit population, again, concentrated in the devastated red line zone. But what happened in New York, what happened in the Bronx, what happened in New York City could not be contained to New York. New York sits at the apex of the US urban hierarchy. And that has implications both regionally and nationally. The way infectious disease works in modern societies is you have an urban hierarchy defined by the largest population center at the peak. And then down the hierarchy, the smaller cities. New York metro region here at the top of that first plane represents the peak of that urban hierarchy. This is from a geography book from 1971. This is not new. When something comes into the country and it's, an emerging infection comes into the, the country, it'll be deposited first in some outlying area, most likely. But the travel patterns will draw the infectious disease into the apex of a nation's urban hierarchy, which is the New York metro region. There it will incubate and then will then blow back down to the smaller cities down the urban hierarchy. That's the first plane. So into New York, incubate in New York, blow back down to Chicago, LA, San Francisco, DC, where it incubates in those city centers. And you get to the, <clears throat> the second plane. Each central city is connected to surrounding suburban smaller cities by the daily journey to work 300 times or more a year. Thus, you have spread in metro regions from the central city to the outlying, outlying areas. In the outlying areas themselves, you'll have diffusion along social networks. This is how things work. On the other hand, if something comes in at the local level by air, a new emerging infection, it'll be drawn into the local city, the local nearest big city, and then drawn into the apex of the urban hierarchy where it will incubate and blow down. For the regional plane, let's look at the New York metro region itself. We'll get to the US urban hierarchy in the next slide. This is a graph, a rather remarkable graph, that takes into account 
the mix master effect of the daily journey to work using uh, 1990 census data. I mean, you, you look at the 24 uh, counties of the New York metro region, you make a big matrix from census data of the number of people who live and work in each county, and you get a 24 by 24 matrix. You work with that and you get, you can calculate what will happen if you squirt something into that matrix. You can look at the equilibrium distribution due to the 300 times a year commute. And that that's the delta mu. It's the equilibrium distribution of, of the associated Markov chain, if you want to get technical. The global index is the equilibrium distribution per unit area. That's what the delta A is. The local index is the percent of the population living in poverty. And for violent crime from 1985, you get a straight line. For tuberculosis, 85 to 92, you get a straight line. For AIDS through 1990, you get a straight line. The striking thing of these straight lines is that they're parallel. For AIDS, violent crime, tuberculosis. Low birth weight, rates of low birth weight. This is the log per 100,000 versus that index. For the log of the rate of low birth weight, uh, weights per, per 100,000 births. The angle is different, but you get the same close relationship. The 24 counties of the New York metro region are in fact one urban polity. They're fragmented and not governed as a unity, but as far as public health and public order are concerned, Everything within a, a radius of 50 miles of downtown Manhattan is a single unit. So AIDS cascaded out of the New York metro region, out of Manhattan mostly, down the local hierarchy of the journey to work. So what happened? Same with violent crime, the same with tuberculosis, the same with low birth weight. What happens in the central city is not contained in the central city. So the 100,000 premature mortalities were not contained in New York, but the circumstances that caused the rise in the death rate diffused outward along the commuting field and raise the death rate of the entire New York metro region. The top plane of that diffusion, let's look at the 25 largest US metro regions. The composite index this time, because you don't have a daily journal journey to work across 25 uh, of the largest uh, metro regions in the United States. The global index is the probability of contact with the New York metro region. Again, you can get this from, from uh, the 1990 census data, migration data. The local indices were violent crime rate for 1991 and the ratio of the uh, manufacturing jobs from 1987 over the manufacturing jobs from 1972. These are boom town, bus town. And what we see is in, in terms of the log of AIDS cases through April 1991, from April 1991 to June 1995, this is the New York metro region. 
as the New York metro region went out, this is just before the drugs came in, again, the U.S. urban hierarchy, like the 24 counties of the New York metro region, it's a unity. It's a system. If you screw up the peak of the U.S. urban hierarchy, you spread infectious disease down through the 25 largest metro regions. This was 100 million people. This isn't Let's look at the first wave of COVID. On this axis, the log of the, this is for the 24 counties of the New York metro region. The log of the COVID deaths per unit population. <clears throat> Again, the global index is the equilibrium density of the commuting field per unit area and the log of the percent living in poverty. And what we see is two systems. We see something like what we saw before with AIDS, violent crime, low birth weight and tuberculosis. But now Manhattan is not the peak, the Bronx is the peak. You see a second system here. This is Prospero's Castle. This is the rich people in Manhattan, Putnam and Huntington County. They weren't drawn into the first wave. Now, AIDS was a slow plague for an infectious disease. COVID is very fast. What we see for the first wave, this is through June of, of 1990, of, of uh, I'm sorry, uh, two, 2020. What happened was, remember the, the three planes. COVID was brought in to northwest of the United States first, probably from China directly. It's a big Chinese. Uh, immigrant population in the Northwest. It then got into the, the air travel system was deposited in New York City, where it incubated mostly in the Bronx, mostly in the Bronx, and then spread down the daily journey to work to the other counties of the metropolitan region. For the 20,000 people who died in New York City in the first wave, over a million died nationally. That means there's a 50 to one amplification the toll of emerging infection. Emerging infection is going to come into some outlying area. It's going to be drawn by travel pattern into New York City. It's going to incubate in the Bronx. It's going to blow down the local urban higher, the local hierarchy, and then it's going to blow down the national hierarchy. The conditions in the Bronx constitute a threat to national security. Um, you got Hakeem Jeffries, you got Senate leadership all out of New York. Someone who was better at blackmail than I am could go to Mitch McConnell with this and say, these conditions constitute a serious national public health threat. Very fast. All right, where are we with respect to fires now? This shows the zip codes of the Bronx. 
the total number of large fires from years 2005 through 2020. 2020 is the last year in the fire department uh, open access database. The maroon zip codes are the top quintile. They had 224 through 281 fires over the 16 years. So they were having more than 10 fires, large fires a year. Uh, by large fires, those are the ones that require at least six engine companies for control. The little offshoot here uh, is zip code 10456. It is the top for the large fires. And this is where the 17 people died at uh, River Parks Tower. Um, this northernmost zip code in the dark red is uh, the speaker of the assembly's district, Carl Heastie's district. But this runs through the heart of the Bronx and it's, it's there where the housing and the local businesses are being eroded by large fires. Now we, we looked at a comparison of the relationship between zip code population and the large fires, the cumulative large fires over the 16 years. The green line is for Manhattan, the red line for the Bronx, the little red dots are the Manhattan zip codes, and the little blue dots are the Bronx zip codes. Two important things about the graph. Number one, the Manhattan slope is much less than the Bronx, which means that as you get more and more populous zip codes in Manhattan, the number of large fires do not rise as rapidly as in the Bronx. The other thing to look at in this chart, in this graph, are the R squares. R square is a measure of how tightly associated these two factors are. Large fires in the Bronx are very tightly associated with the zip code population. That's what the 0 0.80 means, very tight. They are less tightly associated in Manhattan. So something in Manhattan is buffering the effect of population on the number of large fires, but it's not happening in the Bronx. Now we uh, graphed the number of Bronx structural fires by year. The five means 2005 and the 20 is uh, 2020. The trend line is flat. The trend line is gotten by having the total distance of all the data points above it equal the total distance from it of the data points below it. And it's flat, but you've got hills and valleys here. This combination of a flat trend line and the surges is what is described as hyperendemicity. And it's a vulnerability to going into epidemic. So that's where we are now. Uh, how is the fire department servicing these fires? We graphed the total unit assignments, firefighting unit assignments per year. They're going down. Especially remarkable is the extreme drop between 2019 and 2020. This is when the firefighting force was decimated by COVID and the fire department dealt with it by simply not assigning units to the fires. So what happens when you have an overall flat demand and they for supply of service and an overall decline in supply of service? These are the annual large fires over the Bronx. The trend line is definitely up. 
by 2015 and thereafter, the data points are very close to the trend line. So it's going up steadily now for the past five, six years. In 2020, there were more than 300 large fires in the Bronx. That's almost one a day, an extremely high number. So with respect to fires, the recent years and the, uh, the trends are not good. They don't bode well for us. Don't worry, I'm not gonna take you through every data point here. These are public health indicators. The top 12 rows are the Bronx community districts. The bottom 12 are Manhattan. Uh, the highest life expectancy for community districts in the Bronx was 81.8. The citywide life expectancy in 2019, these are data from 2019, was 82.6. So even our wealthiest, best educated community districts didn't come up to the citywide life expectancy. And in Manhattan, most of the community districts enjoyed a life expectancy of 85 or more. Our premature mortality rates are horrendous, especially compared with Manhattan. Manhattan had only two community districts with over 200 per 100,000 uh, people under the age of 65 dying. We had uh, most of ours. It was, I think, eight, eight out of the, uh, no, it was, 10 out of the 12 were over 200. We had three districts, one, three, and six, which were the heart of the burnout, over 300 uh, deaths per 100,000 people under the age of 65. Infant mortality pattern, very similar. Uh, our highest infant mortality was 8.4 per thousand births. The highest in Manhattan was 5.9. There was a Manhattan district that had no infant mortality. Our lowest rate of infant mortality was 3.5. Diabetes deaths, again, uh, our lowest rate of diabetes deaths was 15. The lowest in Manhattan was 3.3. They had only two community districts with over 30. We had six community dis districts where over 30 people per 100,000 people were dying of diabetes. Our homicide rate, similar, same kind of thing. It's the drug deaths though, that are so horrendous. Again, community district one, three and six, had over 40 drug deaths per 100,000 people. The highest in Manhattan was 9.9. .9. Our lowest was 15. The epidemiologists call drug deaths the deaths of despair. The heart death rates look similar until you look at the ages and it's the younger people dying of heart deaths in the Bronx than in Manhattan. So with respect to public health, we are in a truly dire situation. And this is before COVID, COVID made it worse. This is a map of voting participation in the 2021 mayoral election. The Bronx has the very largest area of extremely low participation. The white areas have less than 19% of registered voters bothering to vote in the mayoral election. In order to overcome the problems of our lack of emergency services and our wretched public health situation, we need power and this is a map of powerlessness. We need people 
to organize, to vote, to raise hell. And we have to reverse what this map is showing in order to reverse our dire situations in public health and public safety. Thank you. That's what we have to say this evening. Stop the share. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and, um, okay. I've reclaimed the hosting. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, do Q&A. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallace, for uh, uh, another very, um, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and, and yeah, really added uh, a lot to last week's um, presentation as well. So we'll go ahead and do Q&A. Um, we'll uh, I'll read the questions that folks raise, um, really just in the order that people raise them, unless it makes sense to read um, a couple questions that are related together. Um, and there's a couple of um, uh, practical questions first, um, uh, not for our presenters, and then one for our presenters so far. Um, let me just handle the practical questions. Uh, would be interested in doing a lecture about Heart Island from Melinda Hunt. Um, Melinda, you can get in touch with me if you're still on um, at S Payne, P A Y N E, at Bronx Historical Society.org. Um, and would be interested in hearing about that. Um, and another person was having trouble with their sound. Hopefully that was resolved. But if it wasn't, um, as a reminder, this session and last week's session, um, are recorded and I will distribute the recordings to everyone who registered, um, should be this week. And then you can feel free from there to share the recordings with anyone you'd like. Um, so let me take care of that. Okay, so the first question for our presenters, um, can you explain again what you mean by the local urban hierarchy? Okay, uh, the national urban hierarchy, you've got the biggest city, the second biggest city, the third biggest city, the fourth biggest city, and they're connected by relatively slow travel patterns, and that's the urban, the national urban hierarchy. At the local level, where you've got a central city surrounded by suburbs, the travel patterns are much faster. Generally, you have the daily journal journey to work 300 times a year or more. People go into the central city on weekends. That's a mix master. But area counts as much as the size of the, uh, the the population of the county. So the local hierarchy is more structured than the national hierarchy and it's structured by the by the daily journey to work. So if you live just across the bridge in the Hudson, the, the uh, you know, across the George Washington Bridge, the chances are you're more likely to go into the city than somebody who lives in Hunterdon County. So the uh, the distance from the central city becomes the uh, measure of your position in the hierarchy, rather than how big the central city is, which determines the national hierarchy. Uh, Again, this 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 has been studied. You you can you know you can look this up on the uh, on Google, and there, there'll be endless uh, discussions of it. Great, thank you. Okay, this next question uh, again, folks. Um, feel free to add uh, add questions here. Um, this is uh, uh, another question for our presenters. Is arson a factor in the recent major fires? I think arson is the most successful disinformation campaign, most elegant and most powerful disinformation campaign 
that has ever been unleashed on a victimized population. Uh, this, is, this is America. If something goes wrong, those in power blame the victim and can even convince the victim of their blame. Uh, arson, quote unquote, was not a big factor in the 1970s. There were a lot of set fires, but these were in the context of no fire protection. The current uh, fires are all uh, mostly electrical and maintenance related. Yeah, the, the large fires that we've been seeing have not, none of them have been uh, arson caused. Uh, things like uh, charging e-bikes, uh, space heater use, um, it, overloading circuits. These have been uh, part of the, the large fires that we're seeing now, but we have not seen arson fires um, that were, that came up recently. It's just not happening. Okay, great. This next question is from Michael Gelder. Um, and uh, he's asked two questions. I'm going to read both of them. Um, and and you can decide among yourselves uh, what you'd like to respond to and how. Okay, so um, I'm from Chicago. I'm struggling to understand your point about how New York is a national center and breeding ground for crime. Could you say more about how New York City is the apex of the urban distribution network? I'm not familiar with this concept given that gang and drug distribution networks are independent and don't get their drugs or other contraband through New York City. That's one question. Uh, this next question, was there more that the New York Fire Department could have done to respond to fires when their headcount was decimated by COVID? I'll answer the second one first, okay? We did a similar set of graphs for Manhattan. And Manhattan did not have that steep decline between 2019 and 2020. So somehow the Manhattan fires in 2020 were being serviced uh, more faithfully even during the COVID epidemic than the Bronx fires. This was, this looks like a policy decision on the part of the fire department uh, to service Manhattan, but to let the Bronx go. Right, with regard to the idea of urban hierarchy, you know, <clears throat> Wikipedia will have something on it. The, the New York metro region graphs of violent crime, tuberculosis, low birth weight, and AIDS don't apply nationally. The New York metro region is linked by the daily journey to work. Uh, the national urban hierarchy is not linked by anything that rapid. It's linked by much slower processes. So yes, there will be local uh, drug, illegal drug industries, regional. For infectious disease, however, it's different. For a highly infectious uh, biological entity, a pathogen, that's a different world. That's fast. And that's going to link into the national travel patterns. And you'll have local indices of susceptibility determine how fast something will spread in one of the subordinate metro regions. But how fast it takes to get there depends on the probability of contact with New York City. OK, great. Uh, we have uh, one comment from atten an attendee um, uh, thanking us for the, um, the sessions. So thank you. Um, uh, it's an attendee who's been at both sessions now. 
Um, and then the next question, um, this is from uh, Bill Kinsella. While your analysis is so compelling and well argued, to what extent would you say current members of Congress, House and Senate, and the executive branch are aware of your analysis and its implications? Are there particular members who do know about this in some detail? For example, AOC and Jeffries. What do you think can be done to get your message across more widely? What do you think are the obstacles to doing so? And what are some possible ways to overcome them? Well, let's start with Charlie Schumer. Back when Charlie Schumer was an assemblyman in Brooklyn, we took this to him and his staff and they, they blew the whistle on this. Uh, they blew the whistle on the falsification of uh, policy planning statistics. But this was when he was an assemblyman. Uh, we have been able to talk with local public officials in the Bronx, uh, not, I must say, the borough president, but uh, members of the of the assembly in the state senate and uh, one of the one of the congress people the urban legend the myth of arson the disinformation campaign has been very successful the blame the victim disinformation campaign has been very successful now we're talking 50 years later. Uh, public officials, what's the time frame? Two years, four years? This is a problem. Okay, we, we have talked with the staff members um, from several assembly offices, um, from uh, a couple of the council people, from uh, two state senators. These are people who are based in the Bronx. Um, they, it appears that they seem to be a little afraid of it uh, and are not used to dealing with this kind of issue. They, for example, after the big fire at, um, Twin Parks Tower, a load of legislation came through, but none of it was addressing uh, these kind of issues. They were looking to uh, increase fines on landlords that didn't um, correct violations, but all of, all of their legislation was dependent on the legislation being enforced by the mayoral agencies. Now, the mayoral agencies have not been enforcing uh, housing code related legislation for many, many years. So this new crop is going to be another raft of un unenforced legislation. And until we get the, the voters out, and putting pressure on the mayoral agencies, we can talk to a lot of legislators and very little can happen. Great, that was, um, uh, that was a, a good answer to another question that was raised. I'll go ahead and read the question and, and um, Dr. Wallace, if you wanna add anything to um, uh, what, what Deborah just said, you can't. After the Twin Parks fire, the city council enacted bigger fines for property maintenance on fire doors, but the city admits that they are unable to inspect doors due to staffing. What does this say about the Bronx's political power? <laughs> yes, yes, right. But but the, the failure to enforce, that has been going on for a very long time, even when they were fully staffed. The, the failure of staffing you know, this is a, a thing that arose fairly recently. When they were fully staffed, uh, say in 2015, a law had been passed in 2014 about the fire doors and the doors to apartments. 
That was never enforced. I mean, the peasants have to take the pitchforks, the torches, and the guillotine <laughs> up to the castle moat with break it open. What could I say? You need a battering ram. You need a battering ram. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see this next question. Um, this is from William Rodriguez. The apartment mom moved into near Fordham Road in 1970 had one electrical outlet in each bedroom. Have buildings been required to update wiring to provide for increased demand and needs of uh, computers, electronics, and other modern appliances? I know that electrical systems have had to be upgraded to take the, the three-prong plugs. I am not sure about whether the number of outlets is being regulated now. So I, I can't answer that. Okay, let's see. Uh, this is uh, another question. Thank you, Drs. Wallace. In the COVID study, did you take the population data from the ACS five year or the decennial census? Oh, the ACS five year. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, there's so far two more questions, but feel free folks to, to keep adding uh, questions. So this is from another Chicagoan. Uh, you may be answering my question now. I live in Metro Chicago area and don't believe that we have the number of fires that you're describing here. I attribute that to building codes that have made buildings safer. Is there a way to factor that in? Certainly the fires that we do have are more common in areas of higher poverty. Is the New York Fire Department centrally governed for all the boroughs or is there independent governance for each borough? A few different questions there. Oh, it, it is centrally governed. Uh, there are borough commands, but they answer to the Central Fire Department. Um, the building code in New York has been steadily weakened. It used to be extremely strong. Um, but especially under Blumberg, it went more toward the model code, which really is not appropriate for a city like New York or Chicago or even Los Angeles. Um, the model code is more appropriate for smaller buildings and less dense populations. So that's one, one problem. Our other problem, I don't know what the situation is in Chicago, but we have a whole crop of buildings, post-war buildings, that are now more than 50 years old. And so they are aging badly and are becoming vulnerable to fires now. The, the 17 people died in a post-war building. Uh, the, it was total smoke inhalation, not flames. And that's what the post-war buildings are uh, making people vulnerable to, it's the smoke. Um, so, you yeah. know, the when New York City began cutting fire service and except for us and getting away with it, what happened was because New York is at the peak of the urban hierarchy, other cities looked to New York as an example. So when New York began closing fire companies in high fire incidents, high population density areas, other cities in the nation took that as an example and began doing similar things, in part based on the same uh, models that, uh, mathematical models that uh, HUD had, uh, uh, had uh, developed in New York. So, the diffusion of fire service cuts. Uh, I mean, you know, Baltimore is, is an example. Uh, uh, Jersey City uh, managed to burn down its uh, 
at City Hall some fire service cuts. So probably uh, Chicago has not, like many other U.S. cities, has simply not been, been keeping up with the fire. That would be my guess. Although uh, that's a guess. Okay, let's see. This next um, is, is a comment from Teresa Latta. This event was extremely informative. Thank you, Dr. Payne and Dr. Wallace for your hard work around events that have been ignored mostly about the Bronx itself. I look forward to seeing part one. Uh, great to have you here, Teresa. I'm not sure if you're still with us. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, other Q, uh, other, other Q and A um, folks, feel free to add. I'll go ahead and add one now since we've currently uh, cleared the queue. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, where, uh, if there's any kind of correlation that you've been able to um, decipher right now between uh, the most heavily fire, large fire prone areas of the Bronx and kind of gentrification patterns and the relationship between those two, um, those two phenomena right now. Well, our lords and masters of the real estate industry. I mean, if you take a long view, uh, back in, I'm, I'm going to tell the story. Back in, in 1980, we bought a three bedroom uh, apartment in Manhattan for 7,500 bucks. Then 40 odd years later, that apartment sells for a million. The loss of 200,000 housing units to contagious fire and abandonment served the interests of the real estate lords and masters. Uh, gentrification, you know, think about the turn of the last century when the subways were put in from Midtown Manhattan up into the Bronx. Uh, the Lower East Side emptied out. People went to live in the Bronx because you could you could live there and cheaply and you could work downtown. That hasn't changed. Uh, one thinks that our lords and masters of the real estate industry are looking at neighborhoods near those subway lines. And what they'll do is they'll put these ghastly high-rise apartments that will own, they won't interact with the surrounding community. They won't provide housing for the surrounding community. They'll funnel people into those subway lines for work in Manhattan. At least that's assuming that uh, work from home doesn't actually catch on, uh, which is a separate problem. But certainly, uh, you know, except for working from, from home, uh, I'm sure they have their eyes on, on the Bronx for gentrification. Well, what was interesting for a while recently, this was b before the pandemic, the highest cost units uh, for, for co-ops and condominiums, those were in Mott Haven, not in Riverdale. So yeah, that's yeah. happening. That's happening, definitely. And it's a, the thing that, one of the, the things that inspired um, that question in just tonight's session, it's a um, larger question I, I have in general right now, but is looking at the, the, the maps of the areas uh, that have the highest rates of, have had the highest rates of fire over the last 15 years and realizing, oh, wow, the, the Jerome, uh, Jerome corridor goes right up through there, which is one of the main target, uh, along with Mott Haven, one of the main target areas for, um, uh, for gentrification with rezoning and all of that, you know, definitely uh, a very live issue right now. Um, but but anyway, so so yeah, uh, let's let's go on here. Um, this is, I think, a comment from Charles Jennings. Many cities have required fire safety improvements, especially in tall buildings. 
New York City does not. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Hey. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, another question here. Have you ever presented your findings to the Bronx firehouses? We, at one point, were hired by the Uniform Fire Fighters Association back in the day. We did studies for them of firefighter injury rates and staffing that they used in uh, negotiations. So this is not unknown. Yeah, we, I have sent them emails repeatedly and gotten no response. It's like sending emails to the Bronx president's office. Bronx Borough President's Office, you get no response. And there will be political constraints that go into that. I mean, you, you, you've you all read about the collapse of, uh, of management in the fire department recently. Actually, management in the fire department collapsed 50 years ago and has never been renewed. Uh, the unions have made peace with that. Okay, let's see this next question. This is from William Rodriguez. What was to be gained by letting the Bronx go to ruin? You may have touched on this in last session. Any summary comments? All right. In 1970, uh, Kenneth Gibson became the first black mayor of Newark. In uh, that same year, there were black mayors elected in Detroit and Cleveland. In 1969, him and Badillo made a credible run for mayor from a South Bronx uh, power base. He made a really good run in 1973. Our lords and masters, you know, in, in 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was beginning to turn the attention of the civil rights movement to the northern cities. The barbarians were at the gate. Uh, in 19... 71, uh, Deputy Chief Charles Kirby, in March of 1970, Deputy Chief Charles Kirby of the Bronx wrote a memo to the uh, Fire Commissioner John O'Hagan, subject, projections of fire occurrence, borough of the Bronx, in which he laid out in great detail the forthcoming firestorm in the Bronx and cited certain fire companies by name and number that were essential to heading it off. What the city chose to do in the face of the barbarians at the gate was to trigger what became known as the self-cleaning oven and let the voting block burn prevent the barbarians, the Hispanic barbarians. Right. At, at the last session, we went over uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's benign neglect memo. And that memo declared open season. This was nine, January of 1970. He was helped to create that memo by the New York City Rand Institute. That memo declared open season on communities of color, labeled them as path pathological, and uh, just recommended they be ignored. So the, the fact that we're a minority majority borough. We're the only minority majority county in New York State and the only minority majority borough uh, attracts that kind of view from the policymakers. Yeah. What goes into decisions to engage in ethnic cleansing? Now, there are studies, there are academic studies of ethnic cleansing in other countries. There are studies of the ethnic cleansing of Tulsa. The ethnic cleansing of the Bronx 
of Harlem or Bushwick, Brownsville, East New York, 300 times larger than Tulsa. But the thinking behind it, we, you know, we know these people. We know how they think. This was ethnic cleansing. We know how people who commit ethnic cleansing think. What these folk were able to do was wrap their ethnic cleansing in the myth of arson and blame the victim. It was elegant, an elegant solution to a political problem. Uh, it, you know, it, it's like Stalin saying the, the, the people in the Ukraine st starved themselves and getting away with it. But here we got away with it. Okay, let's see this next uh, question. It's a, uh, a quotation and then a question. Uh, it's quoting from a news article. I'll just read a portion of it. Welcome to Mott Haven, the epicenter of gentrification of the South Bronx. Known as Estella, the two building, 310 million development is nearing completion and marketing and leasing have begun for one of the buildings located at 445 Girard Avenue. Takes up an entire city block directly adjacent to Interstate 87, Major Deegan Expressway. Rents at this apartment begin at $3,008 for a studio and go up to as high as $5,554 a month for a two bedroom, two bathroom. Who is renting these high priced apartments is the question. Not, well, nobody know. we know. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> Yeah, the, the people, quote, priced out of Manhattan. They're getting squeezed somewhere, but they're not the people who live in the Bronx now. Yeah. So the ethnic cleansing, the UN says that there's a kind of ethnic cleansing called development displacement. It is classified, it was classified by the UN uh, Human Rights Council as a form of ethnic cleansing. So ethnic cleansing continues in the Bronx by development displacement. They've, they're still letting it burn, but at a lower rate. On top of that, now we have ethnic cleansing by development displacement. Let's see. Uh... This next is a question. Are the weathering effects of planned shrinkage, redlining, urban renewal generational? And does knowing about this process give us a way to predict future vulnerability? Yes, the, we have data that the burnout of the 1970s caused intergenerational health effects. We do have that. Um, and the, there are studies on other disasters, including the, the Stalin famine in the Ukraine, which also showed intergenerational effects to the third generation. We can't predict how much further it goes as far as intergenerational beyond the third generation. We do know that, um, the housing famine is causing the housing famine and the resulting housing costs are causing uh, extreme distress, not only in uh, the working and, and poor classes, but even among the middle class. And this kind of distress will produce weathering of the, the population, will be aging faster. Let's see. Uh, next question. Hate crimes was part of the title of these sessions, which I admired when I saw it. Is there something specific about applying hate crimes to activities like redlining, or is this primarily metaphorical? No. The redlining criteria that were developed by Homer Hoyt, and people should Google Homer Hoyt to find out about this. He interviewed a whole bunch of real estate agents in the Chicago area. And they told him that the value of land and the buildings on it 
depended not only on the condition, the physical conditions, but also on the ethnicity of the residents. Um, so he built, he was quite overt about uh, grading areas according to the ethnicity of the residents, whether or not they were immigrants and their political activities. It was quite overt. Uh, and these were laid down um, for the homeowners loan corporation of the federal housing agency to apply for whether uh, the property owners could get federally backed mortgages and loans. So yes, they, they those were hate crimes. And what happened with urban renewal, the commu communities that were destroyed were almost all communities of color. You didn't get many white communities being destroyed in urban renewal. The Fire companies were closed largely in communities of color. So it was it was quite obvious, you know, statistically, it would have been uh, highly improbable for this pattern of closing of companies to occur just randomly. Okay, great. This next question, uh, can this data be used to contribute to the discussion of reparations and how they might be attributed. Reopen the fire companies. Take the tax money out of the police department. Those guys in blue that stand around in groups playing with their cell phones. Reopen the fire companies and restaff the housing departments. Enforce the housing code. Pick up the garbage. Start with that because otherwise we're going to have another wave of burnout. Reparations come after you stop the crime, the hate crime. The political hate crime has to stop first. Otherwise there'll be reparations after reparations after reparations and it will never ever be enough. Okay, great, this next question. The move to privatize public housing is increasing. What is going on in the Bronx in terms of privatization? I'm sorry, that's we don't know. We don't know. That's beyond our our area. Sure. Um, okay. This next question: uh, It seems likely that mental health is another domain where weathering and intergenerational effects operate, and another synergistic epidemic. Have you looked at this? Well, I'm in the Division of Epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And I'll put it delicately. You can't get grant money to look at that. A place like Columbia, where I'm based, is a grant shop. You can get grant money to look at ways of treating individuals who are sick. You can't get grant money to answer questions like that, not where I live. But certainly that is happening. Um, there is a new book out by a colleague of ours, uh, Arlene Geronimus. It's called Weathering. And it includes mental health uh, issues uh, that arise out of discrimination and disadvantage. Uh, we highly recommend this book. It's just been published. Okay, uh, so far there, there are two more questions and if folks have additional questions, they can go ahead and add them. If not, then we'll probably end with these two questions, but um, but uh, but if we have more questions, then we'll, we'll continue to go. I was born in early 1950s to parents who had spent their childhood in the Bronx during its golden age. I've often tried to figure out how and why it fell to ruin. Your your sessions have been revelatory. Thank you. Okay, more, more comment. Um, okay, here's the final question for now, unless folks want to continue to add. 
Um, I'm interested whether there's thinking about how the specific legal definition of hate crimes would be applied to these bureaucratic decisions. Hate crimes, I, I don't know what the legal definition is myself. Um, in the in the media, they have usually been applied to attacks on individuals or on small groups of people uh, because of their ethnicity or their uh, their gender or their uh, sexual orientation. Um, we're using it uh, in a sense to call attention to the attacks on whole large communities because of ethnicity and class. There are probably, there's probably international law on ethnic cleansing. And that can probably, I mean, it would take a really good legal team to take that law and apply it to uh, what's happened in the Bronx, it I think it can be done. I think it can be done. I can't do it. We can't do it. But legal scholars could probably put together the hate crime with the ethnic cleansing uh, as an attack. And I'll just give a plug here to, this is an oldie, but a goodie. We Charge Genocide, um, which was published by the Civil Rights Congress shortly after the United Nations uh, released its definition of genocide. Um, and the definition of genocide, I think, is, uh, uh, is, is very uh, apropos of the discussion, according to the UN anyway. I mean, folks, I think, often think of genocide uh, similarly to hate crimes or, you know, something else where there's kind of very explicit, uh, very clearly advertised acts. Uh, but according to the UN, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as killing members of the group. That's kind of the most obvious. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, or forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So at least according to the UN, I think all of the data that the Wallaces have showed us tonight uh, could very clearly and easily be described as genocide. Even back in the 1950s, the Civil Rights Congress was arguing that with um, the Bronx and Harlem and, and other urban areas. Um, but I think the argument is even easier to make after, after what's transpired throughout the course of the 20th century and now. Um, but genocide is another word that sometimes folks like to shy away from, just like ethnic cleansing or hate crimes. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, okay, there's some, some other questions uh, coming up here. How do you respond to the question of race versus class? Okay. For white people, um, you can have a, a class mixed community, or you can have a community that's segregated simply by the cost of the, the houses. For black people, though, they're segregated by race, and you get mixed class communities of African Americans. Uh, similarly with uh, Latin Americans, although uh, not quite so strenuous as, as with African Americans. Um, when we were doing the, the COVID research that we did uh, for the first wave, we saw how class and, and race interacted uh, with respect to um, the testing, the, uh, the cases and the deaths. In the black communities, you had a paradox of low percent positive tests, but high rates of 
hospitalizations and deaths. And what was happening in that community was the educated, wealthier members of the Black community were getting tested, and they were the ones that were not infected. And the, the working class and poor in the Black communities were not getting tested, but they were the ones getting going to the hospital and dying. So you had a class integration that parceled out during the pandemic uh, in the in the black communities in in brooklyn we saw though that there were the white community was segregated by class and you had um areas that were very highly tested and low uh, rates of hospitalizations and deaths, and then areas, separate areas that had very low rates of testing and a lot of um, a lot of hospitalizations and deaths. So how the race and class parcels out in the city um, depends a lot on whether the people are racially segregated or not. If they're segregated, the community is going to be more mixed by class. Um, if they're forcibly segregated, as opposed to the white community, which is not forcibly segregated. It, in, in a word, is complicated. This is America. Race and class are conflated and complicated. <laughs> Uh, we've been working on this since 1619. Uh, I will say one thing. I suffered through two years at Dartmouth where the rich whites went to be trained in how to rule the world. And their definition of human is very, very limited. So it's not clear how many of us in New York make that cut. And if you don't make that cut, uh, you're, you're surplus. So as the empire, the American empire begins to cash out, Instead of building, it cashes out what it's built. Uh, those of us outside the very narrow ruling groups uh, are at great risk. And the, I think there's nobody really who isn't at great risk, risk as long as these people are allowed to do things like what they did in the Bronx. I mean, this is why you could you could go to Mitch McConnell, believe it or not. You, you couldn't go to the guys in the house, but you could go to Mitch McConnell with this. Okay, let's see. Um, there's some more questions and comments that have come up here. Uh, here's a comment. Hate crimes seems more like institutional racism. It's a comment. I don't know if you want to respond to that at all. I'm just. Well, we get to choose what label we put on it. And that's the label we choose. Okay, there we go. Let's see. Uh, another question here. Could you put the name of the perpetrator of redlining from Chicago in the chat so we could Google him, as was suggested? Oh, uh, let me see how I do this. I Let's see. Never... I, I I think I can maybe you can type do it. it. You do it. Okay. Okay. Did you figure it out? Oh, I didn't try. I thought you were going to do it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, just just spell it. Spell it out. I just spell um, it out. Oh, okay. And I'll type it. Omer Hoyt. Omer Hoyt. Okay. Yep. There we go. 
Okay, this next question, uh, let's see. Oh, thanks for these stimulating talks and it's a great point to end on bringing up, bringing up We Charge Genocide. Um, okay, uh, can the good doctors repeat the name of the book about weathering? Oh, that's the title, Weathering. The title is Weathering, and it's by Arlene Geronimus. Let me, I'll put her name in. Okay. There. Let's see. that show up here i'll put it into okay uh let me see here one second okay i'll i'll put a link to um the book uh here let me just find it's by hatchet book group i think yes. here right published by Okay, let me put the link in here. This is directly from the publisher, so there's probably more affordable places to um, purchase. Yeah. But okay, the link is there. Okay, uh, that brings us, I think, to the end of uh, our Q and A. And Dr. Wallace, I want to thank you for um, all the time you've spent with us last Tuesday and this Tuesday, and for the very stimulating, um, stimulating talk and uh, really appreciate your insight into this history that is still very much alive and present um, in the Bronx. And, uh, uh, and yeah, I, I guess I'll ask you um, for the kind of uh, uh, closing word, whatever it is that you, that you would like to close on, and then we'll end the session for the night. Okay, the, the map of the voting participation it's a downer, but it's also a signal that there is something definite to be done. It's not some amorphous problem that's not defined. And going, sending community organizers into that area, that large area where people were not voting, um, would probably be an important first step. And the effort would have to be done without governmental funding because the government would try to subvert the, the community organizing. But we now know where we should turn our attention and, and operate toward re the social, political, and economic networks. Well, those are in large measure, Spanish speaking neighborhoods or where Spanish is, 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 is the first or second language. And this, for people like us who don't speak Spanish, this is a problem. But for people in those communities, that is an opportunity because uh, People from South America and Central America have been through the colonial experience. And they come here and they are subjected to the colonial experience again, but they have a history of resistance that could be tapped and reconstituted under this, this neo-colonial enterprise. Well, Thank you both so much. Um, and thank you for to everyone who's joined us, and uh, we'll send the re these recordings out here soon. Um, and thank you again, Doctors Wallace. Uh, hope everyone has a good night. Well, thank you for letting thank us you. ramble on. Yes, here. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. bye.